Uh, welcome. Uh, this is Terry Fox uh, with Signal Integrity and Electromagnetic Compliance uh, Training. Anyway, uh, this is going to be about Serdes circuits. So you might, Serdes stands for serialized, deserialized, and you might think of it as uh, uh, PCI Express or 10 gig Zowie or a number of other things. But let's go ahead and go through it. Uh, the first thing is that when we try to make Serdes circuits work, uh, you have to first of all understand exactly what they are. So a Serdes circuit starts out as parallel data, it's converted to serial, and then it's transmitted over a high-speed LVDS type uh, connection to a receiver, and that receiver recovers the clock from the data, and the receiver converts the serial data back into a parallel bus, parallel bus plus clock format. So, for example, PCI Express 3 uh, is uh, an 8 gig, gig uh, bit per second uh, transfer uh, rate. It's got a unit interval of about 125 picoseconds. Uh, the minimum eye opening is about 175 millivolts. And the, the eye has got to be open uh, at least 40% of that unit interval, which is about 50 picoseconds. So in other words, if I was to look at this with a storage type oscilloscope and look at the receiver, then as long as the eye is about 175 millivolts high, and as long as it's got a perfectly clear eye of at least 50 picoseconds, that says that that receiver is going to be able to, uh, or according to the specification, should be able to grab the data and convert it back into a parallel uh, bus plus clock sort of format. All right. Now, the first thing you have to understand is that I've got an active piece in the beginning, which is the transmitter. And what's coming out of the transmitter is serial data, LVDS. That means I've got two wires for one bit of data. Now I got a bunch of stuff in the middle that should be time invariant. In other words, it is not, uh, it's, it's just uh, capacitance, inductance, resistance, uh, that sort of thing. And then at the receiver, I've got something active over here. What I should see coming out of the serial side is a nice eye that says this transmitter is transmitting the data and you've got a nice clear eye, plenty of amplitude. Then over at the receiver, this stuff is going to eat up some of your signals. So at the receiver, it'll be a smaller eye, uh, less amplitude, maybe less width to it. But as long as it meets the requirements at the receiver, then this circuit works just fine. Now, what I've got between these, between the transmitter and the receiver, uh, is just this stuff in the middle. So what's the stuff in the middle? Well, I've got traces, I've got vias, I've got connectors. The transmitter is normally specified by the silicon vendor. The receiver is normally specified by the silicon vendor. And kind of the gold standard is that if I could run a simulation that goes from the transmitter all the way through the stuff in the middle to the receiver, then we would, uh, uh, you know, we'd have pretty much the gold standard of, uh, of knowing whether or not the circuit is going to work. But in a lot of cases, I don't necessarily have, uh, you know, the transmitter uh, model. Sometimes I don't have the receiver model. Sometimes I don't have either model. And so what I'm left with is saying, well, okay, the only thing that I can actually control is the stuff in the middle. You can't affect the transmitter except to buy a different uh, vendor. You can't affect the receiver except to buy a different vendor. Now, that's not to say that they don't have, uh, you know, tuning uh, algorithms and so on and so forth in transmitter and the receiver that you may set up. But all of our work, as far as a board is concerned, is this stuff in the middle. Now, when I look at traces and I say, what can, they, what can the trace do to this signal? The trace can, can attenuate it. In other words, it started out as a particular height, and by going through this stuff in the middle, there is some loss of amplitude, and that's what we call attenuation.
Now, I could have impedance discontinuities along these traces, and in that case, I might have some intersymbol interference, which is where something hits a discontinuity, then part of that energy is reflected back, and it might interfere with the next uh, symbol coming in. Finally, we've got things that, that are in the neighborhood, that are, are like crosstalk, and that's where an adjacent circuit could be coupling energy onto this differential LVDS pair. So those are the things that can happen to me as far as the traces are concerned. Either attenuation, impedance discontinuities, or crosstalk. And these impedance discontinuities can get fairly sophisticated uh, even to the uh, extent of uh, whether or not the trace is running over an area of the printed circuit board where it is mainly uh, resin or it's mainly uh, glass. Uh, etc. So you can get down to some very, very uh, detailed things as far as what happens as far as the trace is concerned. Now, when I take a look at the vias, if I had a via and it looked like it was invisible, uh, that it did nothing, it just simply shifted the signal from, from one transmission uh, routing layer to another transmission routing layer, uh, then what I would say is that the, the transmission versus frequency, it isn't doing anything that just a plain old trace wouldn't do. Uh, if I look at a plain trace as I go higher in frequency, I will have more uh, cycles per unit length, and uh, so that kind of looks like a phase shift, but it's a very linear phase shift. Now, a via I would like it to look like just a plain old trace, so I don't want it to have any reflection versus frequency. I don't want it to have any phase shift versus frequency. So if I can get a, a, a via that in essence looks like a vertical transmission line hooked up with another transmission line that happens to be the trace, then that's a very nice via. But there are ways that you can do these vias that are very commonly practiced where you will have problems of transmission uh, versus frequency, you will have problems of reflection versus frequency, and you will also have problems of phase shift versus frequency. So we're going to have a section where we talk a lot about vias. The next thing we do is we start looking at connectors. And much as, uh, as some of my students would like to think that we can say King's X, you don't have to uh, obey the laws of physics as soon as you get to a connector because it's a, it's a connector. Uh, the fact is that we still have the same sort of issues with connectors, that is, what's happening as far as the transmission uh, ability versus frequency, what is the reflection off the, off the connector versus frequency, what is the phase shift as we go through that connector as a function of frequency, finally, what kind of crosstalk is introduced you know, because of that connector. Finally, we get down to things that are like power delivery network and we know that we want to put together a power delivery network that is quiet uh, the same thing would apply to the to the clock and we want to have a board materials uh, uh, board material and stack up that facilitates all of these various things so as far as this uh, tutorial is going to go and this is just the introduction we're mainly looking at the stuff in the middle, and that's traces, vias, connectors, and how do you analyze those things? How do you try to make the stuff in the middle the best it can possibly be between the transmitter and the receiver? Because often, I may not have full specifications on the transmitter. I may not have full specifications on the receiver. Uh, and all I can look at is just the stuff in the middle and say, how do I make this as good as it can be to try to assure myself of a good, solid, uh, low-loss uh, connection. So our focus is the stuff on the middle. So when I look at a trace, we've got things like the width of the trace, the height above the reference plane, the separation, etc. When I look at a via, I say, what happens when the signal encounters that via? And for the most part, we will talk about where does the return current go? Finally, when we look at connectors, we say what happens when the signal encounters a connector? And again, 
the key of this is understanding what happens to the return current when we go through that that connector now in order to go through this the first thing that this requires is that I take on uh, the holy war argument about the nature of a Serdes signal so the next video will address this subject as a baseline for understanding how we succeed in this endeavor so this is the end of section one uh, the Serdes section